So you, you have this incredible book, Winning, that's out. Obviously, a huge fan of Winning, big fan of Relentless. For the people that are listening to this that just don't know all about your background yet, if you'd be you know, willing just to briefly kind of go into um, what kind of drove you to write this book in the first place? Well, you know what? I didn't want to do a workout book. So everybody was taught me, obviously, I was, that's what I'm most famous for is the individuals that I've worked with. But workouts change so often. And everybody wanted to know how these individuals, they got to be at the top and stay at the top. And even when they fell, how they got back to the top. And I was like, and mindset was too of a general topic. Everyone loves to talk about mindset, mindset, mindset. Well, what the hell is mindset? I needed, I need a better definition. So instead of mindset, it's the winnings, the winning mind. There's a huge difference between just a general mindset and having a mindset of actually winning. So what my individuals did, they just constantly won over and over and over again, not just in their sports, but in business and whatever, whatever they did. So being around those individuals, being able to study, ask some questions, see things that nobody else was able to see, having conversations that nobody else was privy to. I mean, literally to be able to sit down with Michael Jordan, Wayne Gretzky, Derek Jeter, and just, just listening to them talk. No cameras around, no nothing. And how competitive that they were, the things that were coming up. And I was like, you know what? There is a really big misconception of what it takes to be successful and what it takes to really be classified as a winner. And I'm known as that individual that I say what others won't say and I see what others aren't willing to see. So when I wrote this book with my co-author, Sherry Wank, I wanted to put the real language of winning, what it really, really takes. It's not about the parade. It's not about the streamers. It's not about the confetti. It's about the road that you take, the amount of time you spend to capture that win and how quickly that win can be taken away from you. Because everybody thinks once you become a winner, you're always a winner. But no one understands most people are actually afraid to win. And I give the reasons of why they're afraid to win. When you wrote this book, who is this book for? Because were you trying to convert anybody or were you just trying to reinforce people? Because as I was reading this, I mean, I probably was nodding along the whole time. And then I spoke to a few colleagues of mine that read it and they, you know, they didn't like it. They didn't like the tone of it. They, you know, they, I found that either, you know, there's some people that just, the, the true competitors, they love it. Like it almost tells their life story in a way. And then there's other people who read it and say, I don't agree with that. That seems a little harsh. Well, you know what? This is where I said when you when you read this book, when you read my posts on Instagram, when you listen to me talk, take your emotions out of it. Just take your emotions out of it. Because most decisions are made because you get emotional about something or something strikes you in a certain way or brings up a bad memory. This book is for everyone. I always say, listen, I'm not for everyone. I should be, but I'm not. Not everybody has this intensity. Not everybody has this desire to be the best. Not everybody has this desire to compete, not just to compete, but to compete to win. You know, we're, we're in a place now where people are so worried about stepping on people's toes and winning requires you to step on their throats by your results. And for a lot of people, it is harsh. It, it is harsh, you know, because if you have the mentality of a winner and you can actually execute at, at it, you separate yourself from the pack. So you get to see, you get exposed. You get exposed to not being in the middle. You get exposed to the decisions you make, the things that you, things that you say, you're putting yourself away from the pack. And once people start to pull themselves away from the pack and real realize how much little protection or support they actually have and how much it's really on them. They're like, yeah, this, this might be a little, this might be a little bit too much. So it's easy for them to kind of go back into the middle of the pack. When the first book, Relentless, it was like everybody's dirty little secret. People would hand it to, hey, I need you to read this book underneath the table. And I'll, it's just like, people don't want to admit that's who they really are. 
because in society, if you're if you're built that way or you think that way, you're not a nice person or people have perceptions of you. And this has got nothing to do with being nice, being hated, being good, being bad. No matter what decision you make, no matter who you're with, some people are going to always going to be with you. Some people are not going to be with you. Some people are going to agree with your decisions. Others aren't going to agree with your decisions. This is about you standing up for what you believe in and going after what's important to you. What do your wins mean for you? For a lot of people, it's financial. For other people, it could be raising their kids. For others, it could be the charitable things that they have, being the best school teacher, being the best, you know, whatever it is. You have to define what winning means to you. And if you take that mentality, you'll see that if it's that important to you, this book is you. And in speaking of defining winning, I know in the book you talk about the two different types of groups when you ask them to, to really define winning and what it meant to them. It had two very different definitions. Well, you know, I asked all my clients, I was like, I do this currently now with any business individual, anybody I work with, still pro athlete. I said, you know, define winning in one word. And you get a lot of individuals that, you know, they'll say, oh, it's joyous, it's euphoric, it's attitude, it's whatever it may, whatever, whatever positive thing they can come up with. And then you ask like the, the people that have like really, really competed and lost and have gotten that close to a win and lost it. And, but then finally got that win over and over again. And they, their language is completely different. They sit down and they, they think for a quick second and the answers they come up with is like, it's hard, it's nasty, it's uncivilized, it's unapologetic, you know, it's uninhibited. It, it's those things. Cause what they're thinking about is the time that they spent to get to that win and what it takes to do it all over again. You know, once you get that win, you get to a certain level in a bank account, you get a certain level in your business, or you win certain championship rings, you know, to repeat again, yeah, it is going to be harder. It is going to be more nastier. It is going to be dirtier. It is going to be more unpolished. It is going to be uncivilized. It's going to be all those things. And people, all those words in the language of winning now aren't, ex aren't accepted. But, you know, as a society and as, a, as people that want to win, you really have to think about what you're willing to really get dirty with, what you're really willing, are you willing to put yourself in a uncivilized frame of mind where you're controlling everything that you possibly can control because if you can do that, then the uncontrollable becomes a little easier to manage. Everybody wants to be civilized. They want everything controlled for them. It's not going to happen. It's just not. So today you're, you're known as probably one of the most elite performance coaches just worldwide. I mean, having worked with Michael Jordan, Dwayne Wade, Kobe Bryant, and so many others. Um, but I'd love if you could speak to just how you got that start, particularly how you first met Michael Jordan. Because I know this was an interesting story where originally, I, I believe you were trying to work with any of the uh, the players on the Chicago Bulls, and you'd reached out to all of them with the exception of Michael. Yeah, that's exactly what I did. So back then, now this is going back into the mid 80s. Remember, no emails. All right, if you had a cell phone, you had one of the big ones with a backpack on it that weighed about 50, that weighed about 50 pounds. Everybody in this room is too young to know what I'm talking about that. But so the only way you could contact somebody was literally if you had their home phone number or through the post office, you sent them, a, you sent them a letter. So I was like, okay, there was a small article in the newspaper that said how Michael was tired of taking the physical abuse from the Detroit Pistons and he's looking to get stronger. I'm like, all right. I was working at a local health club back then with a master's degree, making $3.35 an hour. Yes, with a master's degree, that was the minimum wage back then, folks. So I just said, you know what? I'm not going to be able to get to Michael. I said, all right, he's one of the best players already in the NBA, if not the best. He's not going to work with somebody that's never worked with a pro professional athlete. But I said, you know what? If I can show results to somebody else, then he may see it and there might be... A, you know, a door might get slightly cracked where I can work my way in there. So I wrote, there's four, 15 players on an NBA team. I wrote 14 letters. 
I wrote a letter to everybody except Michael Jordan. And back then, you know, you stick the letters in a mailbox, you put their name on it, you send it to the practice facility. It's fan mail, so they get thrown into the players' lockers. If they decide to read it, they receive it. If they don't, they throw it, they throw it out. Well, obviously, one of those letters made, made it there, and it was sitting in somebody else's locker, and Michael went in into the locker and saw it and pulled it out and read it and gave it to the athletic trainer and the team physician at, time, at that time and said, hey, contact this individual, see what, he's, see what he's about. So I get a call from the athletic trainer during that time and the team physician, and they said, hey, somebody found one of your letters and they're interested in your services. Well, I said, okay. So for three months, we went back and forth, just like they wanted to make sure I knew what I was doing. I actually, I actually attended class and just didn't go through college, uh, tested my you know, like you said, your, your, your degrees in biology, they tested my knowledge on bi biology, biomechanics, you know, physiology, everything. And three months afterwards, they said, okay, we want you to meet this client. I still had no idea who they, who they were talking about. So they gave me an address and they said, all right, meet this person at this address. I think it was either 1230 or 130, one of those, one of those times. So I go over there. This was before the gated house. You could just kind of go in there, ring the doorbell. I rang the doorbell. No answer. Rang it again. No answer. Rang it a third time. Michael Jordan opens up the door. Okay, and I'm not a starstruck person. One of the caveats to this story is, and you'll know this, the best of the best are the most coachable. They're always looking to get better. They're always looking for that less than that 1%, that 1% edge. So it didn't surprise me after I got to know him that he was the only one that actually was like, hey, let me see what, let me see what this is about. So he invited me into the house. You know, I sat down with him, talked for about 45 minutes. Gave, you know, he told me, I said, well, what do you want to do? And he's like, you know, I, I need to get bigger. I need to get stronger. I need to get all these different things. And I sat there and I just told him, I said, well, that's not the way to go about this. And he just kind of, he just kind of looked at me and I explained my philosophy to him and he goes, that doesn't sound right. I said, well, it doesn't get any writer. I said, this is the way, the way to, the way to do it. And he just kind of thought about it and he goes, you know, nobody's, he goes, I've talked to other individuals, but nobody's explained it to me this way. You're the only one that explained it to me this way. I said, give me 30 days. We didn't discuss salary. We didn't discuss money. We didn't discuss any of that stuff. I said, give me 30 days. 30 days turned into 15 years. And the special part about that story is I gave him something that nobody else was willing to present. I say, hey, these are the areas that you need to improve in in order to be able to do those things. You know, you have an individuals who are superstars, great. Everybody wants to become yes men. Everybody wants to agree with, with, with every, everything they say. And I knew if he is smart enough to know there's 15 guys on a, on a basketball team, why am I doing the exact same workout that everybody else is doing? When I play, I'm averaging close to 35 minutes a game. Why am I doing the same workout that somebody who's not even playing doing? Why am I doing this work when I take this many steps in the game? Why is somebody, he goes, this just doesn't make any sense. So he wanted somebody just for him say, I want you to focus in on me. Back then, unless you were a boxer or Olympic athlete, no one had a outside trainer in a sport of basketball, baseball, or anything like that. So, you know, it was another groundbreaking move that he did and saw before everybody else saw it. Is he the type of person that would test those around him, or is that just his personality? Because I remember in the book you described that, you know, you said, okay, let's start tomorrow, and you had to locate all this gym equipment, which at the time, you know, was, was a very different task, or when he would take everybody to the airport, it was almost like a race to the airport. Was was he testing people, or is that just his his style? That just That's just who he was? Well, you know what? In your style of who you are, you do test people all the time. And that's where you know whether they're able to keep up or not. There's that saying that says, you know, when you go to school, you learn and then you get tested. And then in life, you know, you get tested and then you and then you learn. So with us, it was it was like, okay, his staff, the people that work for him, yeah, we all had our educations in different things, whether it was, you know, security, finance or whatever. But he wanted to make sure that when life came and hit with whatever it was going to hit us with, 
that we were able to pass that test. And that was the whole thing by him saying, you, you know, you better keep up. He wasn't just saying you better keep up on the road. You better keep up with everything that's going on. You know, everything that's going on in my life, everything I'm going to achieve, everything that I everything that I want, everything that good and bad that winning brings. And if you can't keep up with both, most people can keep up with one. They can't keep up with the other. You know, all the pressure that winning gives, all, you know, all the notoriety, every word you say gets scrutinized no matter what you say, how many eyes are constantly watching you all the time. So those are the things that you have to be able to aware of that he's talking about. You, you better keep up. And those are things that we were constantly, constantly being tested on. And the equipment thing was just like, Hey, you said 30 days, all right, the clock starts now. It does, you know, it doesn't say, you know, Hey, give you, give you two weeks. You know, like, listen, if you say 30 days, all right, 30 days starts, 30 days smart starts tomorrow. Because if I give you two, if I give you two weeks, that's two weeks farther I am away from winning. You told me 30 days, the clock starts tomorrow. It literally starts tomorrow. So MJ is known as someone who's put the pressure on everybody around him to elevate them. And when he was introducing you to Kobe Bryant, he described you as the biggest asshole he's ever met, which you said was one of the greatest compliments you'd ever received. What, what did he mean by that? Well, you know, it's funny. Yeah. The first thing, the reason I said it was a great compliment, listen, if you're going to be something, don't be a asshole, be the something, you know? So it was like the, he's the biggest, he is the biggest asshole. If you just said he's just a asshole, I'd be like, oh, I failed. No, well, what he meant by that is like, he's not a yes person. He's going to, he's going to hold you accountable. He's going to tell you when you did things well. He's going to tell you when you did things wrong. He's going to communicate with you. He's going to hold you accountable. If you're looking for somebody that just agree with everything that you're saying, this is not that individual. You know, he's going to make you do stuff that he's going to challenge you. You'll say, I don't want to do this. And he'll say, no, this is, this is why you need, you need to do this exercise. This is why you need to eat this. This is why you need to have different sleep patterns. So, and that was perfect for Kobe's mentality. They want somebody to have the same winning edge. They want to have the same winning mentality. They want to have somebody who's, and I say this in the book, you know, the reason I got along with my clients so well even my business clients and my professional clients, wh whoever it may be, is everyone always says, you know, find somebody who's as the opposite of you. Find somebody who's the opposite, you know, to balance you out. I disagree with that. I say find somebody who's just as, can we curse Absolutely. on that? Okay, I just want to make yeah. sure. Find somebody who's just as fucked up as you are. And they knew I was just as obsessed, just as messed up in the head about winning as they as they were. As much as they paid attention to their details and everything in their game, the way they dressed, their you know their their product lines, everything. I paid that much attention into their their training stuff. I told people this. I was the original Fitbit. I used to go back, and there, <laughs> there was a machine called a Betamax. Okay, old VHS where you stuck in tapes, and I would record all the games after the after the basketball game. I would go home. I would literally rewatch the game. I would count all the steps, see which way they went left, which way they went right, how how high they jumped, which leg did they land on, and that was to prepare me for the workout the next day. Because if I didn't have that information, I couldn't plan the workout to the best of the ability to create winning over and over again for these individuals because I didn't have that information that I needed. So being obsessed in those details allowed me to be where I am, to separate myself from everybody else. And that's the difference between what I talked about, yeah, having a mindset and having a winning mindset. The winning mindset, you have defined things that you must achieve, that you must do to get to that end result. And for a lot of the people listening to this podcast, a lot of the business leaders, when you say find somebody as fucked up as you are, I know that sometimes that extends to spouse or partner or that extends to other members of their leadership team and so on. I almost feel you know privileged in a sense that the woman that I married has never asked me to do less, has never given me a hard time for working late, all those different things, because I know how much more difficult it would have been in those moments. What are your thoughts on that in terms of like who people surround themselves with as it relates to winning? Oh, it's, it's so important. Listen, if you can find somebody who's as supportive, as obsessive, as in your goals, as you are, keep that person. You know, in the book, we talk about being selfish. I said, if you can find individuals around you that will be selfish, and this is very important, that will be selfish for you, that will understand 
this individual is trying to achieve this. This is what they're going. This is what they're going after. And those individuals hold you accountable just as much as you would hold yourself accountable. You know, they tell you, hey, when you're slacking off, they tell you, hey, they even tell you when you're doing too much. Hey, this is they don't tell you to slow down. They just tell you is the speed you're taking the necessary speed to get this thing done. You know, so they don't they don't judge you. All right, because you're constantly producing the end result over and over again, but your wins become their wins also. So if you're willing for somebody else to be selfish for you, they have to become part of your wins. If you ask somebody, hey, listen, I need three months, you better deliver in those three months. And that win that you deliver in those three months, it better be your win and their win and the rest of those people's wins. All right. And if you tell somebody, hey, I need a year, They'll give you that year, all right? But in that year's time, you can't ask for another five and have produced nothing. And that's the difference between having those individuals that are selfish for you, having those individuals in your life that understand what you're, try- what you're trying to do, why you may ask to, for them, hey, listen, right now I need you to put your life on hold. All right, but if you put your life on hold, all right, this is going to be our end result, not my end result, our end result. You know, it's that ride or die individual, you know, as I say, said in the book, it's like, hey, they don't question where you're going. They just say, who's driving? Now, here's the dark side of it. When you mention that, let's say you do say that to that person and they say, well, I'm not willing to do that. I'm not willing to, to put this year on hold or these multiple years. Uh, most people would say, okay, well, I'll probably give up on, on this dream. But yet you talk about the dark side of winning that person will persist anyway. Like I said, I talk about and say things that other people won't. There's not an individual I know that doesn't have either a habit or an individual in their life that they need to get rid of. There's not one person. You're holding on to something. You're either holding on to an addiction that's holding you back or you're holding on to a habit that you refuse to let go. There's an individual that's very close to you. It could be it could be a family member, it could be in a relationship, it could be one of your closest friends. And you need you should have made that decision a long time ago, but that's when your feelings are stronger than your mind. Your mind has to be stronger than the feelings because that's what the dark side requires you to do. That's what that's what winning requires. It requires you to make decisions, not suggestions. And when you make decisions, you have to answer the hard questions. These days, people aren't willing to make decisions. They want others to make decisions for them because when others make decisions for you, you always have an out. You can blame, you can blame that person. You can blame that individual. You can blame whatever happens. This lifestyle, it, it's not for everyone. It's extremely intense. It's extremely intense. If you're looking for balance, this, this is not balance all around balance, year round, every day. This is not the way to do it. But I'm telling you, this is what the most successful individuals in any forms of life, they all go through this, not just once, numerous, numerous times. It's not pretty. It's not nice to talk about. It is controversial. But I'm telling you the truth. There's not a single individual. You know what? It's funny. They'll tell you, everyone will talk to you about you need more balance in your life. Well, that's after they've had years and years of unbalance because now it's a good thing for them to talk about that, but they don't want to talk about how many years they were unbalanced to get to what they consider balance is now. It's not a good word to say, oh, you know what? I missed an event. Well, I, you know, <laughs> I forgot about an anniversary. I forgot about a birthday. You know, I, I forgot Sweetest Day. I forgot Valentine's Day. You know, I forgot an anniversary. I, I missed a, a child's event. All right. Those aren't things that people like, like to admit, but we've all done it. We, we've all done it. Balance is earned. It's earned. It's earned the way you want to earn it. It's your decision. You don't find balance. You create it. And your definition of balance may be completely different than my, my definition of balance. It's a question you get all the time. Yeah, I need to find more balance in life. I can't tell you that. You need to figure it out. And when you get closer to balance, what happens is when somebody always tells you, they give you the answer of, listen, how do I get more balance? And everybody wants to add stuff. Well, you need to do this. 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 And now you have more things to juggle and you become even more unbalanced. 
How do you get closer to balance? You got to eliminate the unessentials. What do I said? You know, you got to eliminate, you got to eliminate habits. You got to eliminate mindsets. You got to eliminate thoughts. You got to eliminate relationships. You got to eliminate friends. You got to eliminate the unessentials. And it's so much harder for us to delete than it is for uh, for us to add. I'm sure everybody in the Harris probably have over a thousand contacts in their phone. I have 200. When I switched phones, they were like, do you want to just transfer your contacts? I said, no. I said, no. I said, I'm going to individually put the contacts that I need in there. Because I looked up, don't need it, don't need it, don't need it, don't need it, don't need it. All right. Well, we got individuals that can't get rid of stuff in their closet. If you can't get rid of stuff in your closet, how in the hell are you going to be able to delete something out of your life that you know you need to get rid of? So... I know there's going to be people that read the book, and I know you didn't write it to win a popularity contest. They read the book, or listen to the podcast, and they're going to disagree with it. They're going to say, you know, I don't believe that that's true. I don't believe I should have to give up these things. I believe I can have it all. I can have this balance. I'm curious, was there a time that you believed it too, and were there some events that kind of shaped, um, you know, the belief that you have today of basically saying this is this is how it is, you know, take it or leave it? Well, my watching my parents do what they had to do, watching individuals, you know, like, listen, it's everybody that's ever watched a superstar basketball player. One of the things they strive for is to be able to play on Christmas Day. That's like when you know your team is playing on Christmas Day, you've you've made it. All right. How many games, how many Christmases did Michael have to play on? Almost every single one. Were they all at home? No. Kobe, LeBron, D. Wade. You just go to these individuals over and over again. I'm just, that's part of, that's, that's part of winning. That's what I try to tell you. That you can't say, hey, this is, I want to be at that level and then say, I'm not going to do this. That's the price that winning forces you to pay. It just does. And remember, you just can't, you just don't travel on Christmas Day. You have to travel the day. So you're not there the day before. You're not there the day after. All right. And then you may have to go again on New Year. If you had any plans with your significant others for New Year's Eve, well, guess what? Most likely you're playing on that day too. And then have one of those individuals have that taken away from them. You don't want to be around that individual on Christmas Day or on New Year's Day, all right? Because they're like, I'm not winning anymore. I'm not winning anymore. It, it seems like we've gotten to this point in society that it's it glorifying the setting of boundaries. They're viewing this as courageous. Um, you're seeing this even with elite athletes nowadays and in the, in the media kind of takes a spin on it in the sense that they say they're so brave, they're so courageous when they're making decisions to either take themselves out of competition or to take a break or prioritize their mental health. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with these things, but it seems to go against the idea of winning. I describe that pressure in this book. Well, everybody, you know, obviously, I know the event that you're talking about, and I took a lot of flack for saying that. Yes, I do know that MJ took time off. All right. I understand it. I'm trying to tell people that's what winning brings. That's what, that's what it brings. Every time you win, you have to go back to what we call hell. All right, and hell meaning, listen, you got to go visit it in your mind. You got to go back there to say, hey, what did I do to get here? And how can I keep doing it over and over again to keep to keep winning? And if you don't win, that's where your mind will end up. That's where your mind will end up staying. And that's a point I listen, my thing was it was in support. I was just trying to say, hey, this is you're talking about an individual who's 0.001% at the greatest possibly of whatever they've done. How many people can understand that kind of pressure where everything you do, all eyes are on you, the country is watching what, what you're doing? I understand what that individual is going to because I've seen it. I've seen it with my athletes. I've seen it with it's very successful biz, business people. The point I was trying to make is I'm not criticizing the individual. I'm just trying to tell you this is what elite winning does. It, it does. It takes you to that breaking point every single time you compete. 
every single time. And then you have to make that decision to say, hey, can I move forward? Or I can't. It's nobody, it's nobody else, it's nobody else's decision. Now, if you decide you can't move forward from that, from that decision, people may criticize you, people may say it was a great thing that you did, but no one can really understand the hell that's going on in your head to say, why I made that decision? Did I make the right decision? Should I have done this? It's the constant thinking over and over and over again where everybody's judging what you did, what you said. Some people are for you. Some people are against you. Some people are going to make up stories. People are going to say, oh, you know, the reason you did this is because of this. You know, in the, <laughs> you know, the old story about My Michael Jordan and the flu game. I've been telling for years, you know, that it was it was food poisoning, and people, oh, you know, oh, he was he was hungover, really, all right, for five championships. Now on the on the on the last championship, he just happened to decide on game five, said, let me go get hungover, and in a place where the altitude is really high, when people get things in their own mind, that's what they that's what they want to believe, that's what they want to believe. I can't put myself in anybody else's place. But I've been in situations where I've seen people go through those things. And I'm just trying to tell you, ultimate winners, that's what goes through their head. That's what this book is about. And if you're, if you're afraid to take those challenges, if you're afraid to deal with those things, that's why I said most people are afraid of, are afraid of success because success is going to create distance. It's going to create distance from all the individuals around you. It, it is going to create distance between you and your family, uh, you and your family at, at, at times. All right. If you're not willing to pay the price, then you're never going to have what others may consider those ultimate wins. You may have small wins that you find totally euphoric that are perfect for you. There's individuals that win every single day. They say, hey, listen, I have a nine to five job or eight to 430, whatever it is. I get a paycheck every two weeks. I have a 401k. I have a rental apartment. I have a car. I get vacation time. I get to play on my rec softball team every Wednesday or Thursday, all right? That's perfect for them. That is their win. That is their win. All right. And you look at other individuals and they like, it's not for us to judge that person. That's why I said, you have to determine what your winning mindset is. It's different for each, for each individual. It's interesting now seeing things play out um, with elite athletes. Having read the book, it's it's much easier to understand what's going on here. Um, one of those examples is someone like Conor McGregor. And there's a lot of criticism that he's received, you know, not having won in quite a while. People saying, oh, it's the money. He doesn't need it anymore. But I don't know that it's the money. Because you look at guys like Tom Brady or Kobe Bryant or Michael Jordan, I don't know that money was the driving force for them to continue to, to succeed at the highest level. And you mentioned, I think, in a, in a social post that uh, he really needs to go through hell and either he's unwilling to or he hasn't done it yet, if you were advising Conor McGregor, what would you say to him? Well, it's got nothing to do with the money. All right, he's one of the greatest marketers in his business. He's been extremely successful. He's not, the money is a byproduct of what he's doing. Believe me, when he's in that ring, these comments drive me crazy because I know these people are the farthest away from their first win. When somebody say, yeah, but he got paid. All right. If you have that mindset, you never know what a true winner is about. You never know. Because I've had so many individuals that in their careers, when they talk, when they got to the point, yeah, but I'm still getting paid, I would no longer work with them. I would no longer work with them. Right. Michael Jordan's average salary for his first 13 years was $4 million. Four million. Obviously, in the last couple of years, he got he got the, the he got a bigger payday. But it's four. It was never about the money. Never about the money. He went and played baseball in the minor leagues. Right when he played for the Washington Wizards, he donated his two years' salary, donated it to a charitable cause. I don't remember which one it was. So with McGregor, it's not about the money. So what I would <laughs> advise him is. Before earlier, his trash talk had validity because he was able to back it up, all right? Now what's going on is 
his trash talking is actually fueling the other individuals. It's no longer fueling him. It's fueling the other individuals. Now, obviously, listen, I'm not on the inside of camp. I don't, I'm, I, I'm not to judge that he's not working out hard. He's not doing what he's supposed to be. This has nothing to do with his physical, his physical training and so forth. All right. You can't consider yourself a champion and a winner if you haven't won. So he still has the champion mindset. But he doesn't have the winning mindset because he's not. He hasn't. He hasn't won. There's a big difference between you know thinking you're a champion and actually being the champion. And every time you get knocked down, and this is this is very important. Everybody says when you get knocked down, you need to dust yourself up again and jump right back up. All right, I totally disagree with that, especially for people on their way to winning, all right? When you get knocked down, stay down there for a little bit. Understand why you got knocked down, all right? And then when you stand up, you have to stand up differently. So you get knocked down the first time and you stand back up, you stand up stronger. You're gonna get knocked down again when you stand up again, stay down there. You stand up stronger. When you got knocked down and you stand up again, stay down there. You stand up again, you're more intelligent. Stand up, fall down, knock down, stand up again, you're more resilient. So every time you get knocked down, when you stand back up, you stand up differently. You're a different individual. You're a different individual. And as you win more, the amount of time that you have to stay down is less because you learn a lot faster. But if you're not winning and you keep getting knocked down and you keep standing up the same way, that's where his problem is. Like I said, I don't know about the training. It's got nothing to do with that. I just see different things in how he... When he did his earlier fight, he was this nice guy. He was, you know, and he was trying to be this. And this fight, he was trying to be, who are you? Which is the real, which is the real, real you? Because that's the individual that needs to show up all the time. And when you fall down, there's pieces that break off of you, right? You don't pick those pieces up. Those pieces pick you up. They go into a different place in your mind. They go to a different place in your body. They go to a different place in your heart that allow you to be stronger, that allow you to be smarter, that allow you to be more intelligent, that allow you to be more resilient. Most people, they pick up the pieces and put it back in a, the most easiest place for them to, to fit something in. No, those pieces have to go fit somewhere else because, like I said, you have to stand up a different individual. I just don't know if he's standing up as a different individual anymore. You know, there's a chapter when you talk about, you know, the, the, the price of winning and, the, and this idea of balance. And it's interesting. I know you give a lot of examples and a lot of the athletes and the entrepreneurs you work with, but you were right there with them also making a lot of these sacrifices. And in particular, one of the stories you tell was the one with, with your daughter. And uh, if you're open to sharing it, I mean, me reading it, I have two young girls. So I'm reading this stuff and it's, I, mean, I imagine it's not an easy story to tell. It's not. It's still difficult now. I mean, everybody's had to make this decision. I mean, I'm sitting there. For my work, I travel constantly, constantly, because my clients require me to be in certain places. I got, I got to go. It's a commitment I made for myself. It's a commitment I, I made to them. It's a commitment I made to winning. So, you know, I was packing. I packed my own stuff. My daughter, my daughter walks in, and she goes, Daddy, why do you travel so much? And I said, you know, honey, this is how, you know, I take care of you. This is how I take care of mom. This is, you know, this is how I put food on the table. And she goes, Dad, if I eat less, will you stay home more?
you know, the Hollywood ending, everybody, I would unpack my bag. I would have stayed. We'd have gone out for ice cream. I kept packing. Those are the decisions that winning requires you to make. Not the easy ones. Anybody can make the easy ones. That's why everybody doesn't win. Because those are the decisions winning is going to test you with. And I later on, I had that conversation with her. And I thought I had done things wrong in her eyes. Find out that before I could even finish a conversation, she goes, Dad, I understand. You set an example for me. To go with, go after what's important to you. And she goes, if you didn't, she goes, I would have felt bad. And she, because because of those decisions you made, I've benefited so much more now. So that's why I said, when you, if you're going to make those hard decisions, you're going to do those things, you, you have to go get those wins. There's so many individuals that go out there, they don't get those wins because it takes a different mindset. It requires you to be different. You know, I said, you know, winning requires you to be different and different scares people. Like a lot of people were, are scared to make that decision. You know, after all these years, it still affects me now. Well, it still affects me now, but you're never going to have what that win means to you if you don't have the ability to make the unpopular decisions. You know, there's going to be people who hear stories like this, they'll read the book and they'll hear about these sacrifices and say, well, why would I ever want to win then? Why, you know, I'm not willing to do things like this. I would never do that. What do you think they're missing out on? The way Kobe Bryant described winning, he said, winning is everything. There's a win. Listen, we, we have a chance to win every single day. Every single day there are wins around us. A lot of us can't even see them. They can't even, they can't even see them. You miss out on opportunities when you don't talk to individuals, when you don't look at individuals in the eye, when you don't acknowledge an individual, when you don't simply speak. There's winds around us every single day, but you have to go get them. Yeah, you have to go get them. First, you have to be able to see them. First, you have to be able to acknowledge them. Winning gives you a feeling that you can't, you just can't describe. You really, you really, you really can't. I mean, you watch your favorite sports team or you watch your favorite performer or, you know, we watch all these awards uh, for, you know, for actors, actresses, business people, sports people. And, you know, if your sports team wins, you're up there. Why not have that feeling for yourself? Yeah, it may not be in the sports industry. How about being your own cheerleader and putting that same effort into something that's that important to you and see how, see how that feels. Everyone talks about the athlete, you know, how much sacrifice they made, how talented they are, what they go through. Well, you can do the same thing. It may not be in that endeavor. I get this people all the time when I work with, especially with the quarterbacks I work with, people, you get these, oh, I could do that. No, you can't. No, you can't. <laughs> you know, it's just like there's certain things, but find what you can do and go do it to the best of your ability. No, don't try, because try gives you an out. Go do it. I got no problem with an individual who did everything they possibly could and failed. I have a problem with an individual who didn't. Who didn't. And, and winning, at least to, to those who have won at the highest level, it seems like it has this degree of insatiability where you know some people look at someone like Tom Brady and say, well, the last thing he needs is another Super Bowl ring. I mean, what does he have to prove to anyone? And yet, here he is, again, chasing after another one. If you could describe what that is. He's not trying to prove anything to anybody. He's just trying to prove it to himself. 
He's not doing this for anybody else. He's doing it for himself. And that's the thing when everybody says, everybody says, you know, I'm trying to prove them wrong. Don't prove them wrong. Prove yourself right. Prove yourself right. With each win, I have individuals that always say, listen, I, how can I get more confident? Win. It's a simple, it's the simplest thing. <laughs> the, you find individuals, the more they win, the more confident that they are the more confident that they are because winning is the dealer for confidence. It is the dealer for confidence. All right. That's why you see these athletes that have won all the time. These business people that have, uh, that have won. I mean, you literally have individuals now, you have three individuals. When I grew up, you know, you used to look at the sky and you need to hold a plane and you'd be like, Oh, you're, you're going to, now you got three three multi billionaires competing to see who could who could spend more time in space. Those are their wins now. That's what they're going after. All right, they're not in their mind. They're like, okay, yeah, they are competing against those under other individuals, but they're also competing with what what's winning is telling them in their mind. So, it for people that always say, man, the last thing he needs is another ring. The last thing they need is another dollar. The last thing they need is another successful. That's you know that's always a that's not, that's a mindset and that's not the winning mindset. All right. Who are you to say what that person needs? Who are you to say that that's what that person should be doing? Because most of the people that are giving advice aren't doing those things themselves. People who have the worst relationships give relationship advice. People that aren't financially successful, they tell you how to spend your money. Everyone all of a sudden is an expert in, in something that's never won at anything, and social media has allowed, allowed us to do that. It's allowed us to do that. You know, Mike Tyson said this perfectly. He goes, you know what? He goes, back in the day, if you said something to an individual, you'd be, you know, you'd be worried about getting hit in the jaw. He goes, now having that phone allows you to talk trash, criticize individuals, say things to individuals, and be and be protected. You know what I always say for the individuals that that have anything negative to say about me, put them in the same room as I'm in. Now they're my best friends. You know, the level of courage goes down. Winning requires you to have that level of courage all the time. It allows you to have that level of confidence all the time. It has you have to have that resiliency no matter no matter what's go, what's going to happen. Well, Tom knows he could walk out on top, right? And if he doesn't win, everybody's going to say, oh, he should have He should have done this. He should have done that. He should have done that. No, that's what you wanted to do. That's what he, give him and give those individuals credit for deciding what their winning mindset was and what they wanted to do and not what somebody else wanted them to do. They know exactly who they are and that's the most important thing in order to win. You have to know exactly who you are, not what somebody else wants you to be. And I wanna to touch on the process of winning. So Matt Frazier was on the podcast, five-time CrossFit Games champion. And I, I was asking him, I'm like, you know, Matt, you have this, you know, this immense drive to compete. Um, what about the training? He's like, I hated the training. Uh, he's like, every minute of every day had to be managed from when I went to sleep, from when I ate, from when I trained. He's like, it's miserable. But and so, I, you know, I asked him, I was like, so why did you do it? You know, he's like, well, because I crave that result. That's it. I mean, there's no, what else is that? What else is there left to say? Training is hard. All right. It, 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 it is hard. It's supposed to be hard. Winning is hard. All right. Eating properly is hard. Saving money is uh, uh, investing. All the all these things that be, it is supposed to be hard. Everybody's looking for that easy path. Everybody's looking for those steps. That's why people. When when I was writing the book, one of the big thing that you know Sherry and I we were discussing with the publisher and other individuals. Everybody's saying you got to put steps in there because steps sell books. Five easy steps, you know, ten steps to greatness. Five steps to success. You're talking about the most fittest human being in the world, all right? Have him run up a flight of steps, all right? I don't care what kind of shape you're in. That, 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 that shit is hard. And everyone's looking for those easy steps. There are no easy steps. No, we're trying to make everything easy. When I go to work out, you know, I used to see advertisements all the time about, you know, work out in the comfort and ease of your own home. If a workout is comfortable and easy, it's not a workout, 
It's it's not it's not a workout, but that's what that's what sells. That's and motivation sells too. That's why there's so many individuals out there that sell motivation because what when they are selling motivation, that means you're going to keep buying. I don't sell motivation. I sell elevation. All right? And the big difference between the two is, you know, exactly what Matt said, all right? Motivated individual, you have to constantly keep selling uh, motivation is man you got that person you got to convince every single day that you know yes the workouts are hard it is nasty it is going to be unpolished i have to manage all all this all those individuals when you sell elevation elevation is internal it's not external motivation is external all right elevation is internal they know when they get to the gym when they get up yes this is going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. It's going to be nasty. It's going to be tough. I know it's going to be painstaking. But they take that accountability on themselves. They take that accountability on themselves. And there's a huge difference between motivation and elevation. Motivation is that sugar high. It's that initial sugar high. You get you get really spiked up. I see people that go to these events all the time and they come in and they're all pumped up and they're like, yes, I, yeah, I, I'm ready to I'm ready to go but they have no direction of where they're going in. You know, I tell you the most popular, when I give my presentations, I don't want a standing ovation. When I get done, I want complete silence in the room. I want complete silence in the room because then I know those individuals, they truly, when they say they're ready to run through a wall, they're going to run through that wall. They are going to run through that wall because that's something that's going to last, that's going to stay with them. That's going to stay with it. And winning stays with you. Your wins stay with you. No one can ever take those wins away from you. Nobody can ever take your elevated mindset away from you. They can take your motivation away from you because motivation, you got it through somebody else. But what you earned on your own, no one can take that away from you. And to anyone who's read the book, if, if you haven't, I'd encourage you to get the audio book as well because you've got the commentary between you and Sherry and there's a, a, the chapter on winning is selfish. I remember in the commentary, you had to convince Sherry, I think of this initially, um, that winning is selfish. What is, how do you define the difference between a selfish winner and a selfish loser? Well, a selfish winner, they get that end result and everybody around them wins. Everybody around them wins. That's what I, what I said about this earlier. A selfish winner is like, has a team around them that where individuals are selfish for them. And when they get that win, everybody wins. Everybody that's sacrificed, everybody on that team, whether they get rewarded uh, monetarily, financially, whatever it may be, they, they get a chance to feel what everything is, is about. All right, a selfish loser blames everyone else. They blame their team. This is why I didn't win. They don't have a victory mentality, all right? They have a victim's mentality. You know, selfish people, they don't own up. They don't own up to their, they don't own up to their mistake. It's always somebody else's fault. Listen, if you're, in a, if you're in a bad relationship, it's funny, and individuals that go through a divorce, everyone likes to always tell their side of the story. No one likes to own up and say, you know what? Yeah, I, I, I was part of this. I, I, I did this. All right, I take any time one of my clients, my business individuals, when they don't win, I take it personally. What did what could have I done better? What did I what did I miss out on? All right, and you get people in in especially in my business from the training standpoint on social media, but when their client has a great game, boy, they're posting them left and right. When that client has a bad month or a bad week, you can't you can't find that individual on your social media. I take as much responsibility if not more responsibility than the client itself. What could have I have done better? What did I what did I miss out on? That's a selfish winner. That's a selfish winner because they want more for that individual. A, a, a selfish loser would be like, ah, you know what? I'm not out on the field with them. I'm not on the basketball court. I'm not on the baseball diamond. I wasn't in the boardroom and they were making those decisions. And we have to be careful with that word. That word selfish has such a bad ring to it, but we make selfish decisions all the time. We just like to give it creative words. When people says, oh, you know, uh, me time. What's the difference between me time and selfish? You're asking time for yourself, right? All right. You tell an individual, you put a schedule together and you put, 
meditating for an hour, people are like, oh my God, that's so healthy for you. That, you know, it's, gonna, it's so needed to relax the mind and do all that other thing. And I say, hey, block out 11 to 12. I don't want to be disturbed. You know, oh, you're so selfish. What are you, you know, what are you going to, don't worry about what I'm doing during that time. Guys hanging out with guys, girls night out, man cave. Those are all selfish things. I don't understand when it became bad to take care of yourself. The more you take care of yourself, the more you can give to others. The people that call you selfish are the same individuals that are constantly taking from you, taking from you, taking from you, taking from you. And the one time you say no, now all of a sudden you're selfish. They don't remember the hundred times you said yes. But the one time you said no, that you said, that you finally was like, I don't want to do this. I can't do this. Now all of a sudden you're selfish. When you decide to take the pieces that they took away from you. There's so many times with a selfish thing that people constantly take, 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 take. And when they're taking, I mean like not just taking stuff from you physically. They're taking something away from you inside. They're taking your time away from being success. They're taking your focus away from the things that, that, that matter to you. And they won't repay those things. It's funny. You you have that person that's constantly asking for you. Go ask that individual one time for them to do something for you. Well, they got a thousand things in their schedule. They got a thousand things in their in their schedule. It's got to be both ways. I, do things for other individuals because you want to do it, not because you have to. Plain and simple. That's what winning requires. And I've spoken to so many business leaders that have read the book and I asked me, what did you think of the book? Um, many of them described it as kind of an odd way to describe it. They said it was therapeutic where they had spent so much of their life constantly hearing you're crazy. You shouldn't do that. Almost swimming upstream constantly. And don't get me wrong. They don't regret it. They don't regret their results. But even in you know, today's society, they can't help but think, is there something wrong with me? Like, is, can, should I just be satisfied? Like, do I need help? And in the book, you talk about the fact that knowing who you are and accepting who you are is the ultimate superpower. It's the ultimate superpower because everybody, you go through, you go through life being relentless. You're born, you know how to win. You know, everyone uses a story about, you know, a baby learning to, uh, learning to walk. A baby doesn't quit. Every time it falls, it, it gets up. It's going to, hey, I'm going to go figure this out. All right. And then we lose that ability to go, to continue to push ourselves, to go, to go get those wins. And we look for other people's approval. And I always say, if you have a newborn and the baby starts to walk or it does something special during that moment, who's the first individual to acknowledge it? It's not the parent. It's the baby itself. The baby will clap for itself when it learns how to walk. The baby will clap for itself when it learns how to do something that it it hasn't it hasn't done before. There's that self validation that it gives. And as we grow up in life, we look for validation from every from everybody else. We look for approval for them. We listen to what they tell us to do, how we should act, how we should dress, what we should say. All right. So you take that relentless thing out of an individual. It was funny. Probably two two weeks ago. Sherry and I were in an event, and we were at the we were at the airport, and we were going into the the lounge because our flight got canceled. I don't remember something got delayed, and there was this young girl, could have been more than two years old, just dancing up a storm, just dancing up a storm, all right. And we're standing, behind, you know, they were the only ones in the room first, and then we came in, and we were waiting in line, and the mother immediately grabs her and says, "Stop dancing!" And all of a sudden, the kid just puts his head. You just literally, you just set that kid back five years from a confidence standpoint. You, you literally set that. So now everybody says, this is the way you want to be. You know what? If you read this book, yeah, you know what? And you agree with it. Yeah, you know what? If somebody says you're crazy, you are crazy. Everybody that's done something special in this world, all right? You didn't go from 4,000 square feet to 40, 40 or 44,000, whatever it is, if you thought like everybody else. You had to be crazy. How many people told you that? Oh, you're going from what to what? No, 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 go a little smaller, you know, just maybe, maybe double in size. Go, they said, no, this is, this is what we're going to do. Being crazy is a compliment. Right? It, when somebody says you're crazy, that means you see things that other see. 
Everybody that's done something special in life, they've all been criticized for being crazy. It's a compliment. When somebody says, you're crazy, you're nuts, I said, yes, I am. We all have flaws. Instead of uh, what we do is we try to hide our flaws. Your flaws are your gifts. Use them. That's what make, That's what separates you from everybody else, and that's what winning does. Uh, it forces you to use the things that other people aren't willing to use. So when people call you crazy, when they, when they talk negative about you, when they do all that stuff, we know it's coming. We have so many speakers that constantly talk about the same thing over about how to deal with haters, how to deal with negativity, how to deal with this stuff. Before you go on that road to win, that road to success, that unforgiving race, you should know that already. You should know that already because <laughs> the more you win, the more those individuals are going to be on that path. So if you don't know how to deal with them and you're not expecting them to multiply and expecting you to pull you back, you got no chance. More people are going to call you crazy. You're going to be, you know, what I said earlier, I said, you know, winning scares people, you know, different scares people. It does. And that's what winning requires you to be different. It just does. You cannot think and act and do things that everybody else does. And just like the first book, Relentless, and this book, Winning, what it did was it validated. It allowed people to say, you know what, I'm not the only one. There's many of us out there, but there's not that many of us that are willing to step out and speak that way because of the pushback that we're going to get from other individuals that say, you know, most individuals say, I would never do that. I couldn't do that. They actually did and found out all the consequences that came with thinking that way. We're going to that. And they said, you know what? This is too much. This is too much. So the way to validate their own thinking is to say, oh, I would never, I would never do that. And Tim, as we come to a close, this being the Game Changing Attorney podcast, what does being a game changer mean to you? A game changer to me means actually knowing that you have the ability, the thought process, and the actions to create change. And it starts internally. All right. You get individuals that every time they put out a podcast, it's life-changing. Every podcast is not life-changing. Every podcast is not epic. Every TV show is not number one. All right. I get individuals all the time that come in and say, I have the number one rated podcast. Well, you know, we can verify those things now, right? <laughs> you know, we can do that. If you're going to actually change the game, the change starts within yourself. Where people can actually see that the thing that you've changed into is actually your real self. You've introduced, you know what this book does? This is where I told this, this, this book does. I said, it's going to introduce you to an individual that you haven't met in a long time, and that's your true self. It's going to make you look at yourself the way that you haven't looked at yourself in a long time. It's like being in, it's like everyone says, stand in the mirror, you know, and see what you see. I said, stand in the mirror, and in order to be a game changer, realize what's real about you and what's fake about you. Take what's real, leave the fake behind. That's how change starts. <laughs>